start by putting things in context. I've listed here the top 10 causes of death in 2019 in the United States. I wanted to highlight is that cancer is the second leading cause of death in the US with heart disease being number one. Last year with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, so in 2020, COVID became the third leading cause of death. But just to again emphasize that heart disease and cancer remain the top one and two causes of death. The World Health Organization has estimated that 30 to 50% of cancer deaths could be prevented worldwide. A study from the American Cancer Society focused on the United States estimated similarly that up to 45% of cancer deaths are linked to modifiable factors. Here are the factors that that study focused on. Many of these are familiar. So the recommendation would be to avoid tobacco exposure, um, avoid being overweight or obese, consume moderate amounts of alcohol, small to moderate amounts of alcohol, um, limit consumption of red and processed meat, and be cautious about UV, uh, UV radiation exposure and exposure to specific infections that have been linked to specific cancer types. On the flip side, one would recommend a diet that is rich in fruits and vegetables, high in fiber, um, obtaining adequate amounts of calcium in one's diet, and getting plentiful amounts of physical activity. The study also tried to zero in on those things that are most critical for cancer death prevention, and those are what are highlighted in blue on this slide. So what about among men with prostate cancer specifically? Well, you've probably heard the statement that men diagnosed with prostate cancer these days are more likely to die of something else. Where does that statement come from? Well, there was one study uh, conducted in the United States using cancer registry data. This was a national study and they looked at cancer registry data at all men diagnosed with prostate cancer between 1973 and 2008. And there were nearly 500,000 men diagnosed during that time frame. Over the 35 year period followed in this study, 259,000 of these men passed away. 16% of these men with prostate cancer died from their disease, died from prostate cancer. It is important to note, however, that this era spans the PSA eras. It's pre and post PSA era. So the PSA started being used more regularly in the United States in the 1990s. So among those 259,000 deaths that occurred in this large population of men with prostate cancer, 30% of the deaths were due to prostate cancer, which means that 70% of the deaths were due to something else. And what was that something else? Well, there were many causes, but really one of the leading uh, causes of death in that 70% was due to heart disease. So I bring this up because I think it is important that when one is thinking about what dietary recommendations to make for men with prostate cancer, it's really important to consider the bigger picture and what are such men really at risk for with regards to comorbidity, other chronic diseases and the risk of death. And so as you can see, heart disease remains an important um, cause of death for adults in general and also for men with prostate cancer. So what are the uh, risk factors for heart disease. Well, many of you are familiar with these, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, tobacco exposure, as well as diabetes, overweight and obesity, not getting enough exercise and an unhealthy diet. Interestingly, many of these overlap with risk factors that we and others have reported on for reducing risk of lethal prostate cancer. So similarly, we would recommend um, avoiding tobacco exposure, avoiding obesity. Um, some intriguing associations have been reported between insulin sensitivity and prostate cancer outcomes. And then of course, diet and exercise do appear, appear to play a role. So just a small comment here about cholesterol. While dietary cholesterol itself has not consistently been linked to prostate cancer outcomes, there are some common medications uh, prescribed for heart disease prevention that also appear to have potential benefits for preventing prostate cancer death. So again, the, disease, the data are not entirely consistent, 
However, there are some reports that suggest that up to 30 to 40%, um, excuse me, there have been some reports out there stating that statin use and aspirin use, common medications for, prescribed for heart disease prevention, have been associated with a 30 to 40% reduction in the risk of uh, prostate cancer death. So this is intriguing and our team is interested to study this further. I've tried to summarize here on one slide, it's a bit busy, but tried to summarize in one place, the recommendations for heart disease prevention, cancer death prevention overall, and then prostate cancer death specifically. And so these are specifically the dietary recommendations for each of these major um, chronic disease outcomes. And so what you can see is there are some consistent patterns and overlap, fortunately, uh, which makes it easier for one is try to think about what one should eat and do in their day. So avoid trans fat, limit saturated fat, that's generally what would be recommended for heart disease, total cancer, and also for prostate cancer, as well as specifically for lethal prostate cancer, um, we would suggest avoiding whole milk and try to opt for healthy vegetable fat sources instead, such as olive oil or nuts. So what I've tried to do here over in this column is just sort of put the nuances, the additional nuances um, that we would add on top of these general cancer prevention recommendations. For heart disease, one would recommend diets low in cholesterol, salt, and sugar. Um, trying to reduce or limit sugar intake is also recommended for cancer in general. Skip alcohol just for a moment. Uh, across the board for all of these things, we would also generally recommend uh, limiting consumption of bread and processed meat and having a diet that's rich in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, beans, legumes, and fiber. Specifically for prostate cancer, you know, when you're trying to reduce one's intake of red and processed meat, we would also then specifically recommend try fish or skinless poultry instead. These things have been looked at specifically for prostate cancer outcomes. And then among the vegetable groups, we also highlight trying to consume cooked tomato products and cruciferous vegetables specifically for prostate cancer. Back to alcohol, it's a little bit confusing because in general, alcohol would not be uh, recommended or we would recommend really limiting or not consuming alcohol if one is really focused on preventing cancer death. However, for heart disease, it's a little more nuanced because there are some studies that have reported that modest, you know, modest amounts of alcohol intake may offer some uh, benefits for heart disease. So their recommendation is, their recommendation is limit to one to two drinks per day. There have been some intriguing um, results for prostate cancer specifically where red wine intakes so or a very modest amount of red wine intake uh, has been associated with the lower risk of prostate cancer death or metastasis. Um, but again, it's lim there are limited data. So a nuanced recommendation would just again be limit to three to five servings per week. So the level here at which the benefit might've been seen was um, at a more conservative amount actually than for heart disease. So in general, the recommendation would be if you have prostate cancer and you do already consume alcohol, it's not something that you have to completely eliminate from one's diet, but try to be rather um, conservative about the amount of intake. So a little bit more on the specific recommendations for reducing lethal prostate cancer. Here is a list of factors I reported in 2019 um, as post-diagnostic health behaviors that might offer benefit for reducing the risk of prostate cancer recurrence or death. This was presented in, at this very same symposium in 2019. So all of these I believe are familiar with what I just showed on the previous slide. And then what I've done here is tried to show what updates would I make today or now in 2021. So in the past year, our team did a comprehensive literature review on um, post-diagnostic health behaviors and the risk of prostate cancer recurrence and death. And what I've tried to reflect here is some nuanced um, changes from 2019 till now that we might make based on that recent lit review. So everything in white is basically the same or consistent. Um, we would still recommend those things. The things that are in gray, you know, several of these dietary factors here, we would generally still recommend them. However, I grade them out just to say that there are less data available compared to the things in white. And so in the past two years, there's not been new data or more corroborative data to substantiate those recommendations 
There's nothing to contradict it necessarily per se either, but ideally one would like to see more consistent evidence coming out. And this is actually a limitation of our field and something that our team is trying to work on, which is to gather more data on post-diagnostic um, health habits and subsequent risks in patients with cancer. Things in blue are a slight updates. So I believe this actually just said high fat dairy before, but um, some of the reports really have kind of zeroed in that whole milk may be the factor to avoid here. And then I commented previously about the nuances with regard to wine intake that have come out. So next I'd like to share some diet tips from Greta McCare, who's a registered dietitian with the UCSF Cancer Center. I had the opportunity to sit in a panel discussion with Greta recently for a audience um, comprised of individuals with cancer, including prostate cancer. And here's some of the tips that she shared. Aim to have about two thirds of, one plate, of one's plate filled with uh, plant-based foods. Um, animal protein from sources like skinless poultry, fish and egg whites are fine to include as part of a diet that's rich in plant-based foods. A Little bit more detail about that egg comment. So eggs have been associated um, in some studies with an increased risk of um, lethal prostate cancer. However, that link has not really been firmly established, so there's no need to really totally exclude eggs from one's diet. And Greta recommended an amount of a couple eggs per week or less. And then with regards to supplements, again, it's best to meet nutritional needs through diet uh, when possible. So in summary, among men with prostate cancer diagnosed in the PSA error, heart disease and other chronic diseases remain important causes of death. The diet recommendations to reduce risks of heart disease overlap with those for preventing cancer death in general. And recommendations for reducing risk of prostate cancer death are generally consistent with those of a heart healthy diet. And I've tried to provide here a few of those nuances specific for prostate cancer. Thank you very much for joining us. Hi. I'm Stacey Kinfield, an associate professor and epidemiologist at UCSF in the departments of urology and epidemiology and biostatistics. Today, I'll be talking about exercise as part of your prostate cancer treatment plan and our trials at UCSF and beyond. Research shows that physical activity after diagnosis can lower risk of prostate cancer progression and mortality and overall mortality. I led the first paper on this topic published in 2011. This figure shows total activity displayed in met hours per week on the x-axis and the risk of all cause and prostate cancer specific mortality on the y-axis. Looking at the green bars, the graph shows a significant protective association between physical activity and all cause mortality at levels of about 30 minutes of walking most days per week or jogging three days per week denoted by the orange circle. However, for prostate cancer mortality, looking at the blue bars, a significant protective association was only observed with much higher levels of physical activity, denoted by the red circle. When looking at the data by type of activity, we reported that vigorous activity was important and associated with a 61% lower risk of prostate cancer specific mortality at levels of three or more hours a week. Dr. Aaron Van Blarigan led a complementary study using the CAPTCHA registry based at UCSF and reported that men walking briskly for at least three hours a week had a 57% lower risk of prostate cancer progression compared to men walking at a slower pace for a shorter duration. Based on these data, intensity seems to be important with greater intensity equal to greater benefit. Since then, other cohort studies have reported similar findings while showing that moderate exercise is also beneficial. For example, in this cohort study done in Canada, four and a half hours of walking, which is equivalent to about two hours of vigorous activity, was associated with a 40% reduction in the risk of prostate cancer specific mortality. And in the last few years, two meta-analyses have been completed reporting a 31% reduction in the risk of prostate cancer specific mortality and a 40% risk reduction in all-cause mortality for the most versus least active prostate cancer survivors. So what's the take-home message here? Engage and exercise for your prostate and overall health. 
Our recommendations based on the US Physical Activity Guidelines and the American College of Sports Medicine are to build up to 150 minutes per week of moderate aerobic exercise or 75 minutes per week of vigorous aerobic exercise or a combination. Keep in mind that two minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise is equivalent to one minute of vigorous intensity aerobic exercise. And you can mix up the frequency and duration to meet these recommendations. The data show that building up to 300 minutes per week of moderate activity or the equivalent in vigorous activity has more health benefits. So if you can, try and incorporate as much activity as you can. Um, and according to the new 2021 ACSM guidelines, bouts of less than 10 minutes are also associated with favorable outcomes. So any amount of activity that you can squeeze into your day is helpful. The benefit of regular physical activity to lowering risk of dying from prostate cancer, in addition to lowering risk of dying from colorectal and breast cancer, was added to the 2018 US National Physical Activity Guidelines. At this point, you might be asking, well, how do I assess how hard I am exercising? So I'm gonna spend a few minutes discussing the different exercise intensities. For light or mild intensity exercise, your heart beats slightly faster than normal and you can talk and sing. You won't break a sweat. Um, and this includes activities such as a leisurely walk, a casual bike ride and some light yard work. Moderate intensity exercise will raise your heart rate and you will break a sweat. You will still be able to talk but not sing. And this includes activities such as brisk walking, playing doubles tennis, swimming laps at a moderate pace and some sports. While well, vigorous intensity exercise is when your breathing is deep and rapid, your heart rate is elevated, and you are sweating a few minutes into the activity. You won't be able to stay in more than a few words without pausing for breath. And these include activities such as jogging, hiking uphill, playing singles tennis, or racquetball. Keep these intensities in mind when you are aiming for your 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity or your combination of moderate to vigorous intensity activity. Now moving on to muscular fitness, this type of fitness is optimized through the implementation of resistance training. It's particularly beneficial for prostate cancer patients as the side effects of treatment often lead to a decrease in muscle mass and a loss of physical function. So this type of exercise done regularly will help you to preserve your muscle and bone mass, and it can also reduce risk of falls and fractures. Systematic reviews done on the effects of resistance exercise in patients with prostate cancer have demonstrated that resistance exercise improves muscular strength, fatigue, and quality of life. And an updated review done in 2020 also shows that resistance exercise can improve body composition, um, has positive effects on bone mineral density, and, and sexual health as well, including self-reported sexual function, as well as sexual activity and interest in sex, while significantly improved in the exercise intervention groups versus the control groups. So for re resistance exercise, we recommend that you perform muscle strengthening exercise at least two days a week. Try to choose eight to 10 different exercises that work major muscle groups and aim for two to three sets of eight to 12 repetitions for each exercise. Start with lighter weights that you can lift 10 to 15 times safely. Um, and then over time, as you get stronger, slowly increase the weight. And when you do this, really aim for six to 10 reps um, that you're doing with good form. As you get stronger, add another rep a week until you're back up to your 10 to 15 reps. And then at that point, increase the weight again and so on. And there are a lot of different online videos to help show you proper technique. In addition, we also recommend flexibility exercise and stretching um, as important for uh, maintaining full range of motion and making it easier to perform activities of daily living. We recommend doing at least two days per week of flexibility exercise and try to do this after you've done your aerobic or resistance exercise when your muscles are already warm. I hope you've learned a lot about the types of exercise and the dose that will provide the most benefit to you. I wanna conclude by telling you about some novel research we are doing at UCSF and invite you to be part of it. We recently finished a study called CHAMP to determine the safety and feasibility of aerobic and resistance exercise in men with metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. 
Uh, the study was originally designed as a supervised exercise study, but we found that it was really hard to have patients come on site three days a week. So we redesigned it as in a remote intervention. We offered a concierge service to help link people to a local gym and were able to demonstrate good adherence. 82% completed the 12 week study and 90% or more of the prescribed workouts were attempted. We did see changes in performance tests corresponding to the prescription. No safety concerns were identified and the study had a high satisfaction with 90% recommending, willing to recommend the program to others. This remote exercise protocol from CHAMP was added to the global exercise trial for metastatic prostate cancer patients, which is opening at UCSF very shortly. Our overarching goal is to offer an intervention to every patient with prostate cancer to answer novel questions, regardless of the cancer stage or treatment that the person received. We're now at the point where we have finished a lot of the pilot work. Those studies are highlighted in gray. Um, and in some instances, we've moved on to version 2.0, offering an updated or extended version of the original study. Our open enrolling trials are in green, while our studies that are opening soon are in blue. And these studies in blue and green are funded by the National Institutes of Health, the Movember Foundation, and Myovant Sciences. I want to highlight a few of these studies to show the breadth of our work across different disease stages. ASX is a for a study um, of men on active surveillance. It's a re remote four month aerobic exercise trial, uh, evaluating as the primary outcome change in cardiopulmonary fitness. Prostate 8-2 is for men choosing surgery. It's a four arm two year diet and exercise trial and men must enroll at least two weeks before surgery. And there's a number of outcomes of interest including PSA recurrence. And we're also part of a global study of exercise, as I mentioned earlier, called Interval Gap 4. This is for metastatic prostate cancer patients. And I lead the Global Study Coordination Center based at UCSF. It's a two-year trial to examine if exercise prolongs life in metastatic prostate cancer patients, and we plan to open in July 2021, just a few months from now. The only two studies are currently, the other two studies are currently open. Um, and for all of these studies, participants do not need to be a UCSF patient. And if you're interested, please check out our studies using the link below. Lastly, I just wanna mention uh, all of our new resources available for patients. Our research group is dedicated to creating resources and you can access these at the link shown and get on this link to join our mailing list when we will update you when we have new resources available. Uh, some are specific to prostate cancer, but others are more general, such as our booklet for diet, exercise, and mindfulness during COVID-19 pandemic. We hope you find these useful and we encourage feedback um, from you as well. Thank you so much for your listening and for your time. Um, there is a clarifying question about whole milk intake. So, um, the person says they've seen articles that all dairy should be avoided. Can I clarify? So actually that is, that might be prudent, I guess is how I would answer that. The reason it's a little bit confusing is that studies have looked at this two different ways. Some of the studies that have looked at risk of developing prostate cancer identified dairy as an entire group or entity that appeared to be associated with increasing the risk of developing prostate cancer. And actually this is work that I contributed to several decades ago. Um, and in those studies, we didn't see one product over the other really coming to the forefront. And so that's why I think some of the recommendations have just been to be prudent, try to limit dairy intake overall. I can say though that the studies that have really focused on diet after diagnosis in men who've already had prostate cancer or have prostate cancer, in those studies, it does appear to be the high fat dairy or whole milk intake that is linked. So that was the difference between the studies and why the recommendation might be a little bit confusing. Uh, that being said, I could also qualify that the post-diagnostic data are limited. There's only like three studies, four studies that have been able to look at uh, dairy intake after, diagnos after diagnosis, but at least in those studies, it was more the high fat whole milk um, item that appeared to be linked to uh, metastatic fatal prostate cancer outcomes. So I hope that's helpful for whoever asked that. I can mention that Dr. Kenfield showed those books, the resources, we do have a little section up on there about dairy and it does recommend uh, if you do take dairy, try to reduce, 
avoid the high fat types and then try alternative sources like nut milks and things like that. There was another question about dark chocolate, which I think is a nice way to close on a Friday, the end of the day. So what do I think about high cacao dark chocolate? Um, I'm guessing this is going with like uh, dark chocolate, that kind of dark chocolate tends to be lower in um, fat and sugar. So I guess I would say if you're gonna have a treat, this is a good one. I can share more anecdotally that Walter Willett, who led the Department of Nutrition at the Harvard School of Public Health for like 30 years and is kind of the father of modern nutritional epidemiology, um, condones a dessert comprised of nuts, fruit, and dark chocolate as a way to continue to enjoy life while being mindful of one's dietary intake.